Yeah, so most of our content here is probably not really assessed much. Um, it's just in bold and red if you really need it. Um, so I'm just going to cover basics of hematology. So anemia of various etiologies such as macrocytic, macrocytic, um, normocytic anemias, um, your hematological malignancies, your blood films, hemostasis and thrombosis, uh, a bit of tr about transfusion and pharmacology. So basically hematology. So hematopoiesis mainly occurs in your bone marrow after birth, but before birth, you basically have your extramedullary hematopoiesis in your liver, your thymus, your spleen. Um, but before birth, you basically have it in the yolk sac in the first month, and then eventually, as your organs evolve, that happens in the spleen and liver. But after birth, um, before your 20s, you have it in your uh, long bones, whereas after 20s, you have it mainly in your exoskeleton and also your pelvic girdle. So uh, hematopoiesis basically relies on your myeloid and your lymphoid progenitor cells. So your lymphoid progenitor cells basically produces your lymphocytes, your QB and your T lymphocytes, whereas your myeloid progenitor cells basically produces your, um, your granulocytes, so your neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils. Um, it also produces a bit of your monocytes, but that can also happen through the lymphoid progenitor. Uh, you also have your platelet production through your megakaryocytes as well. So red blood cells um, structure, uh, they're basically anucleated in biconcave and you lose your nucleus um, after your uh, red blood cells are fully formed. And this is regulated by your uh, erythropoietin in your kidneys. And this is regulated um, by that. And if you don't have your kidney functioning well enough, then you don't produce red blood cells. So red blood cells initially are produced as reticular sites in your first in, uh, S, uh, one or two days. And then eventually they mature into red blood cells for about 120 days where they circulate and eventually get destroyed. So each um, red blood cell is made up of um, hemoglobin and each hemoglobin is made up of four globin subunits. Mainly HbA would form two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. But if you have HbA2, you can form delta subchains as well. And this happens in certain types of thalassemia. Uh, you also have the naturally forming HbS. Um, that's usually fetal uh, hemoglobin. So your two alpha chains and your two gamma chains. These have a high affinity for oxygen. So you have a left shift in your oxygen hemoglobin curve. So you have a high affinity for oxygen. So you favor loading of oxygen versus unloading. So this uh, eventually gets uh, completely eradicated seven to eight months postpartum, which is why some of your thousand only manifest after about six months. So this is a hemoglobin oxygen um, curve. So on your left shift, you would favor oxygen loading. Uh, so in decreased temperature and also decreased to 3 dpg, which is in um, the HBF case, and also decrease um, uh, hydrogen or proton, uh, and also decrease carbon uh, monoxide. You, would, um, you have favor loading of oxygen. So such as in your lungs, if you have a lower temperature, you would have also less acidic environment, and therefore you would have more oxygen um, loading. And in your muscles where you have a higher temperature, you would favor oxygen unloading to supply the muscles with tissues. So um, a fun note is that, is that if you have 75% of uh, oxygen saturation, it doesn't really mean that 75% um, of the individual hemoglobin is saturated, so not, not like three or four molecules, but 75% of all the hemoglobin is saturated. So um, these are just basically types of cells. So if you have your neutrophils, um, neutrophils are pretty easy to identify because they're hyper-segmented uh, segment, uh, nucleus with three to five lobes. Or use things like your eosinophils and basophils. Like your eosinophils are basically the pink ones here. And then basophils are darker than that. Um, your monocytes just have a C-shaped uh, nucleus and your platelets are basically smaller than that. Megakaryocytes are actually the biggest um, cells in your body, I'm pretty sure. So they're actually pretty easy to identify as well. You only really only see them in bone marrow aspirates or trephines as well. So lymphocytes, um, they mature at different locations. They start off in the bone marrow, but they uh, mature in different locations. So your B lymphocytes mature in your bone marrow, whereas your T lymphocytes mature in your thymus. And um, your plasma cells are generally bigger than your regular lymphocytes. So your plasma cells actually mature from B cells. Okay. So I just have some questions. Someone answer for me. Yeah, I think I have more here. Yeah. Yeah. 
anyone? Yeah. And this one. Pretty simple stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is going to go through it again. This is probably the most important one in terms of like year two and year three syllabus as well. It's pretty easy to identify as well. Um, Microstatics is probably the easiest. So it's basically um, differentiated into microstatic, normal static, and uh, macrostatic anemia. So microstatic means the that the MCV is small. Um, normal static means 80 to 100. Macrostatic basically means larger than that. And um, with each one, you would do different examinations and they have different etiologies as well. So um, your blood cell analysis, mostly you would identify, um, you, you basically do a full blood examination and these will include most of this. So hemoglobin for males is uh, above 130, whereas for females is uh, above up less than uh, above 115 and below that would mean anemia. And then you also have your red blood cell count, your hematocrit and also your MCV. MCV is basically the size of the cell, um, normal is between 80 to 100 as well. Um, and then you have your red cell distribution width, which um, basically identifies your variation in the size of the cell, which is uh, particularly important in iron deficiency anemia. And you also have your reticular site count, which I mentioned previously. So, yeah. so um, anemia, signs and symptoms of anemia is basically related to hyperdynamic circulation of anemia, um, also associated with um, other things like um, lack of oxygen in the body. So signs of anemia will include conjunctival pallor, pallor of palmar creases, also tachycardia and dyspnea as well. Um, you also have angina palpitations if you have insufficient um, circulating oxygen as well, uh, causing cardiac um, dysfunction. So in microstatic anemia, you have your thalassemia, anemia, chronic disease, iron deficiency, lead poisoning, inside of robustic, and the rest are pretty easy as well to identify. Um, okay. So microstatic anemia, um, ideally you'd start off the iron study because the main one to rule out is iron deficiency anemia because that's the easiest to rule out as well. Um, you can do HP electrophoresis if your iron studies are not conclusive to identify any sort of thalassemia. Um, you can also do some red blood cell tests and blood, uh, blood films, but they not, may or may not be particularly conclusive. So an alpha thalassemia is an autosomal recessive condition. So you would have alpha and beta thalassemia. They affect different groups of people. Alpha is in Asians, beta is in um, Greeks or, or any Europeans. So um, in both, you either have a abnormal HP formation or a reduction of the HP amount. So in alpha thalassemia, you actually don't have any substitute chains, but in beta thalassemia, you actually do have substitute chains like delta chains forming HbA2 instead of HbA. Um, in alpha thalassemia, you just have a relative excess of beta chains forming um, certain types of hemoglobin, such as hemoglobin BART um, and hemoglobin H. Um, hemoglobin H is for beta chains and hemoglobin BART is for um, gamma chains. So um, you have four different types of alleles for, for uh, alpha thalassemia, and with each one, you get a, a more clinically significant condition. So one deletion, you actually get no symptoms. This is known as minimal. You, you are completely asymptomatic. But I guess it's uh, important to know that you have that in case you mate with someone who does have the condition causing, uh, causing for like um, alpha thalassemia minor or HBH. Alpha thalassemia minor, you might have a minor micro, uh, microcytic anemia. Um, cis and trans is basically um, between Asians and Africans. The Africans one have, have it worse. Um, if you have three deletions, you get HBH. And um, if four deletions, you get um, HB bots, um, which is incompatible with life. Um, and beta thalassemia is much more straightforward because it's really only two alleles. So if you don't, if you only have one deletion, it's beta minor, but it's um, relatively not clinically significant. If you have two point mutation, then it's a major one where you have a lot more problems. So um, because alpha thalassemia doesn't actually have a replacement chain, you actually have to do DNA, uh, DNA PCR to, know to, uh, to find if there's any DNA deficit. Uh, whereas a beta thalassemia, because there is a substitute chain, you actually undergo electrophoresis um, because you have the elevator HbA2. So in alpha thalassemia minor and uh, minimum, you don't actually do anything. You just watch them if there's anything. Um, HbH, you have to watch them. And sometimes they get iron, um, iron overload, so you have to iron chelate them with like um, their, um, their, their ferrous, I mean. And um, you might also do regular poblotomy as well, but unlikely because they are already um, anemic, so you won't really do that. Um, in hydroxyphetalis, you actually don't treat them because it's, it's too much money and too much work and they're probably going to die anyway. Uh, and most importantly, genetic counseling. And beta major is pretty similar to the other ones as well, but it's probably not as severe as um, HB um, bots. 
So in thalassemia, you actually get this hair on end, um, especially in beta thalassemia minor. So you can see the lines, these ones, are actually, um, I believe, I actually don't know what they're caused by, but you get that on x-ray. Um, on blood film, you get these target cells, so like these ones. I, th I think you also see an iron deficiency anemia, but not as much. So it's basically a buzzword for thalassemia. Um, for the phenotype diagnosis, you do DNA sequencing for alpha thalassemia and HB electrophoresis for beta thalassemia. Um, and iron deficiency anemia, this is probably more important for OSCEs. So um, basically etiology, can um, you can basically group it to decrease intake, increase loss, and increase requirement. So if increased loss is probably a GI bleed, either also a malignancy, uh, whereas with intake, it could be a uh, deficiency in absorption. So Crohn's disease, if it affects the terminal ileum, uh, well, not terminal ileum, it's in proximal jejunum, and also um, your uh, any distal gastrectomy can also affect that. If you have increased requirements, usually during pregnancy or uh, sometimes cancer as well, um, you can also get uh, iron deficiency anemia. So signs and symptoms uh, I talked about earlier, but um, iron, deficiency, uh, iron deficiency specific symptoms would be PICA where they have a um, need to eat clay. They also have this um, nail pitting sign, it's known as colonychia. You also get angular stomatitis, which is um, dryness at the side of the mouth and also hair thinning. No. So iron deficiency studies, um, you, the main one to really look at is just uh, serum ferritin. So in iron studies for iron deficiency anemia, mainly the ferritin will be low. There will really be no advocates where the ferritin is low. Ferritin is basically a storage of iron. Yeah, the rest is not really very important. Um, you can just know the anemic, uh, anemia of chronic disease where you have low serum iron, but other than that, the rest of them are not really important. Um, so as I spoke about earlier, you have red cell distribution with um, in iron deficiency anemia. So you see a lot of different sizes and shapes in, in iron deficiency anemia. You also get anisocytosis, which is different sizes, polykalocytosis with different shapes. Um, pencil shaped cells, which are the, the tiny one, the thin ones, and also uh, hypochromatosis, which is um, light cells. Uh, so treating, you essentially give oral, so ferrograd C, you give them with vitamin C to improve your, your absorption of iron. Um, it actually looks like melina. doesn't smell like melina, but it looks like melina, and that's what patients always say, um, that, their eye, the, that their feces looks better and they're bleeding their stools, but it's actually just iron. It actually, it's green, but it may look black. So um, if you eat too much, you can get hemat um, iron toxicity. That causes nausea and vomiting. That's why iron is not really ver very well tolerated. So you give them iron chili can age in, in, in those cases. Um, only give iron in very, very severe cases or, or refractory to oral iron. So um, excessive iron is known as hematochromatosis. Um, you can get uh, excessive iron deposits in your organs of hematochromatosis. So you need to basically um, let the blood out. So phlebotomy, regular phlebotomy in these cases, or iron chelating agents. But I believe most of the time you just give them a section. Um, and uh, symptoms-wise, you get bronze diabetes. So you get hyperpigmented skin. Um, you also get liver failure with um, hematochromatosis. So your, you, your liver becomes cirrhotic in the end. Um, often it's uh, through fam um, like passed down through family. So a lot of them in the families would be affected as well. So maybe test whole families as well. Um, yeah. So it's just summary site. Yeah. Um, Normocytic anemia. So test-wise, you would do reticular site count because it's basically in different shape into those that are basically replicating versus those that are not replicating. If they're replicating, it, um, it means that the bone marrow is fine. If they're not replicating, the bone marrow is not fine. So it's probably something like my, um, myelodysplastic syndrome or, or any sense of aplastic anemia or lack of EPO because you can't produce blood cells. Whereas if you have hyperproliferative, it means that bone marrow is completely fine. So it's probably due to blood loss or any hemolytic anemia. So, yeah. So in aplastic anemia, you get pancytopenia because your bone marrow is basically hypocellular and you basically have increased fat space because the bone's just not working. Usually um, it's caused by drugs like chloramphenicol, which is an um, antibiotic, um, often used in um, ophthalmology where they give um, eye drops. So hep B can also cause this. So you just get pancytopenia, uh, so you basically don't get any line uh, lineages of cells. You usually have to do a bone marrow aspirate to find to identify this. Usually to find to identify the architecture of the bone. So in hemolytic anemia, you can identify it as intravascular, extravascular. So an intravascular one is mainly stronger 
than of extravascular and in intravascular it's usually due to um, some sort of like a maha or aiha or um, g6pd deficiency where you get stress of the cells so it causes shearing in the bloodstream causes the blood cells to be um to lie prematurely as well so an extravascular is mainly sickle cell or, or basically membrane uh, deficiencies or defects um I believe malaria can cause intravascular or extravascular, but I can present mostly as extravascular. Usually it's where the spleen it, um, eats it up. So, uh, so G6PD deficiency is actually a X-linked recessive condition. So in these people, you actually just avoid giving them those foods like fava beans, um, basically anything with oxidative stress. Um, anti-malaria drugs are known for these. I think anti-TB drugs are also known for this as well. Anti-TB drugs are horrible. So yeah, um, blood films wise, you just get Heinz bodies or bite cells. Yeah. In Maha, uh, this is where in systemic diseases, your endothelial cell of your endothelial layer of your vessels actually damage. This causes um, your fibrin to clot, and then this actually causes fragmentations of your blood cells, causing um, schistocytes. So that's basically the only time you see schistocytes. So um, you see in other types of subtypes of PTP, like um, thrombotic, thrombocytic purpura, and um, HUS, which is hyperhemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, you'll learn this in year three. Um, I heart is basically autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, usually, it's it could be due to autoimmune diseases, but mostly it's just um, it's, uh, it's usually not really due to any specific cause. So idiopathic. Um, so the main test you do is a Coombs test. Um, it's just an antibody test. So it causes a direct Coombs test, not an indirect one, just a direct one. Um, you also see spherocytes for some reason. Um, so the warm type and cold subtype is just basically different temperatures at which it occurs. Um, the warm one is more associated with autoimmune diseases, whereas the cold type is more associated with um, specific uh, um, like infectious diseases. So sickle cell anemia is literally your, your cells are sickled. Um, I think you guys learned a lot of this in like micro B in like first year. So you get um, glutamic acid to valine substitution at position six, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's essentially the same thing that they test all the time. Um, you also get how jolly bodies due to hypersplenism. So your spleen doesn't effectively remove the, um, the substance in the red blood cells that should be removed. I believe it's actually due to, it's actually a remnant of your, of your nucleus. Yeah, so they don't remove it. So it looks odd. So that's how jolly body this one. So macrocytic anemia. So macrocytic anemia is basically B12 and folate. You also get a hypo, um, hypothyroidism as well, but um, that's mainly it, B12 and folate. That's really the ones you need to know. So megaloblastic versus non-megaloblastic. So megaloblastic is your B12 and folate um, deficiency. So megaloblastic, you, it, it's identified by your hypersegmented nucleus. So you have more than five lobes because normal nucleus, uh, no, normal neutrophils have three to five lobes of um, neutrophils in your neutrophils. So if you have more than that, it's a hypersegmented neutrophils, and this is known as a megaloblastic one. Whereas a non-megaloblastic, you won't actually have any hypersegmented neutrophils. So it's just easy to identify in that way. Yeah, so in B12, um, this is more clinically significant than like neuro exams and things like that because you actually get peripheral neuropathy. Um, B12 deficiency often seen in alcoholics because they don't drink, uh, they drink so much that they don't eat proper food, so they don't get B12. And B12 is actually quite hard to get. So doctors always like to test it, but um, the fact is that if your B12 levels are normal six months ago, chances are they're going to be normal now because it takes years and years to deplete it. Um, but deficiency of B12 is actually really severe. You can get neurological damage. I think you can call uh, it's it's called Kasakoff and Wernicke syndrome. Yeah. So you get um, deficiency often due to Crohn's disease again because Crohn's affects anywhere from mouth to like butt. So that's essentially anything that occurs on the track pathway. You can Crohn's can affect it. So you get peripheral neuropathy and also brain brain stuff. So um, you replace it with hydroxycobalamin, which is an uh, intramuscular injection. Folate, on the other hand, is actually really fast to deplete, and folate deficiency can actually mask B12 deficiency. So the important thing is to just do both and correct both, and correct B12 first before you correct folate because it can mask neurological symptoms. So um, you just give them oral folic acid because it's not that bad, and um, it's really fast to build um, storage as well. So yeah. Anyone? Yeah.
Does anyone know the answer? Yeah. Ah, this one. What's the diagnosis? Do you guys know the answer? No? Anyone? Wait, who doesn't know the answer? I think it's very easy that way. You don't know the answer. Okay, I'll run through it. So, um, wait, you answer my questions then. Um, what does the abnormal HP show you? Yeah, and low MCV. Yeah, so what are the causes of microcystic anemia? <laughs> so it says tails. So T is? Yeah, A? That's probably a bit harder. Anemia of chronic disease, but it can also present as normal cystic anemia. Um, I? Yeah. Uh, L? L and S are probably not that significant. It's never going to really come up. Lead poisoning inside a robustic anemia. So those are not really going to come up. So it's really you're banking on thalassemia versus iron deficiency anemia. So you look at your, um, your iron studies. What does the iron level show you? It's normal. So what is it? Yeah, so it's your thalassemia. But since there's alpha and beta, remember how alpha thalassemia, there's no globin chain um, like replacement of chains, right? So you will only do a DNA PCR. Whereas beta thalassemia, there is a substitution chain. So you're gonna do electrophoresis. You guys know what electrophoresis is, right? You run it through a gel and then anything that's heavier moves slower because of the, the weight and also the charge. Yeah, so that's why you have beta thalassemia. Ooh, what did I do again? Okay. Yeah, any questions? You get it? Yeah, okay. We're pretty easy in this one. Yeah. Oh. This one. You can answer me. Yeah. Okay. So hematological malignancy. So this is probably the one that's probably lowest yield, I feel, but it's probably more important in clinical years. Um, so this is where it affects. So essential thrombocytes this affects um, thrombocytes. So you get more thrombocytes in your bloodstream. Uh, polycythemia rubarara affects um, uh, increased uh, erythrocytes. And then you have AML, um, ALL, which affects the blast cells. And then CML affects your myeloid progenitor, uh, the non progenitor cells, so the mature ones. And CL affects the mature ones as well. Multiple myeloma is plasma cells. Multiple myeloma is probably the most interesting one, I feel, but it's less assessing um, uh, preclin. So you have your myeloid and your lymphoid. So myeloid, uh, yeah, CML. So CML is basically like buzzword city. It's like our rod. It's just our rod cells. There's a specific subtype of AML where, uh, called APNL, acute promyelogenous um, leukemia. And this one is the one where you treat with um, all retinoic acid, um, the ones where you treat with vitamin A. Yeah. And it's actually, um, they get really severe. And, well, they, they become really sick at first, but once you treat them with vitamin A, the prognosis is actually really good. So AML is basically the one that you don't want to get in all the uh, hematological malignancies. I mean, like uh, all the leukemias. So AML is the one that everything gets changed to. So CML can become AML in the blast phase as well. So it's basically pretty serious and prognosis is not that great. Um, in these ones, you usually get heat passes, uh, spenomegaly, you also get gum hypertrophy, increased bleeding and bruising due to low platelets as well. Um, in the blood film, you basically see an uh, increase in blood cells, so increase um, by 20% myeloblast, so that's basically a specific number. You also get thrombocytopenia, which is why you bleed. Um, our rods are these ones. Yeah. 
So uh, ANO, on the other hand, is the one that's pretty, like most old, a lot of old people get it. No young person really gets it. Um, it's usually a translocation due to Philadelphia chromosome, the 922 translocation with BCR able. Um, so in these ones, you actually don't get as many blast cells, but there is a phase in CML where you can get a blast crisis where you get ANL in, in the end, and it's pretty, uh, it's a bad prognosis. And if you have anemia in CML, it's actually also not a good prognosis. Stomacytopenia is also not, uh, is indicative of a bad prognosis in CML as well. So you treat them with imatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So anything that ends with IV is tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Yeah, so you get good prognosis with imatinib. Yeah. So this is your myeloproliferative disorders. So uh, essential thrombocytosis. Uh, all the myeloproliferative disorders all have some sort of jet to mutation, um, depending which one. Uh, polycytemia rubrorum has the highest jet 2 association. So essential thrombocytosis is about 50% of jet mutations, but it's basically a disorder of excessive platelets because it's central thrombocytosis, yeah. So you get spontaneous clotting, um, which can lead to consumption of platelets and subsequent bleeding, kind of like DIC. Yeah, so you get, um, because of the, um, the clotting, you can get finger ischemia and embolic events, but you can also get uh, thrombotic events as well. So you generally do not treat them. You manage them with aspirin because aspirin prevents platelets from aggregating. Um, you also present, um, give them hydroxyurea as well because it's a myeloid suppressor. So primary myelofibrosis, um, these ones also have jet mutation, but not as much as polycythemia rubrorum. So basically these ones is where the bone marrow fibros. So you don't actually get um, if, if, uh, efficient hematopoiesis because there's just no space for normal production of blood cells. So in these ones, you also get splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. So in the blood film, you usually just get teardrop red blood cells because the red blood cells have to squeeze through the fibrous space um, and you get a dry bone marrow aspirin because everything's just fibrous. Um, usually you have to give them bone marrow transplant otherwise the prognosis is extremely poor. Uh, in polycythemia rubrorum, these one, this one is particularly easy to identify, especially in the question, because usually um, they they get really itchy after a hot shower. They, uh, and their fingers get really red, really painful. Um, they also get uh, very um, they get headache and paresthesia in the head, so acroparesthesia. Um, investigations wise, you can usually identify through your FBA, so uh, you notice an elevated hematocrit, red blood cell, and also um, HB. These ones you can also clot, um, and more so than essential thrombocytosis. So you re really treat them with venesection. You may treat them prophylactically with aspirin, but um, it may or may not be helpful. But usually venesection is probably most helpful for symptomatic relief, so off the hands and th things like that. So uh, myelospastic syndrome, this is basically where um, you get ineffectively um, maturation of all cell lineages as opposed to like uh, one cell lineages where you get maturation of, the, uh, of that particular lineage. You really don't get any maturation of any lineages. So you get pancytopenia and it's particularly severe as well. Um, I once saw a patient who had a spleen about this size, like huge like use the whole abdomen with spleen due to myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, usually they get quite sick as well. They get infections, everything. So basically anything you see with the blood cells, they don't have. So they'll be anemic, they'll be thrombocytopenia, so they bleed. Um, they also don't have any neutrophils, so they get infections really easily as well. So basically supportive care and just waiting for them to die pretty much. So lymphoid neoplasm, so um, these ones are a lot easier. So ALL is children predominant. So these, these are the ones where if you see a kid in leukemia, it's probably just ALL. And um, this, this is basically AML in uh, the, the lymphocytes region. So you get lymphocytes in your peripheral blood with more than 20% blood cells. Um, these ones are actually pretty easy to treat. They're very aggressive, but uh, most of them actually enter remission with drugs. That's so ALL, on the other hand, is the one that affects old people as well. Um, ALL, often people die with it rather than from it. Um, so in ALL, the bus is smart cells. So if they do a peripheral blood film, because the cells are so brittle because of inf uh, infective maturation as well, the, uh, the, the red blood cells actually kind of lice and smudge. So you get smudge cells. Um, yeah, so usually you get the B symptoms, the constitutional symptoms like fatigue, weight loss, night like sweats, things like that. So then you have your lymphoma, your Hodgkin's and your non-Hodgkin's. Hodgkin's generally have a better prognosis than non-Hodgkin's, but non-Hodgkin's is more common than Hodgkin's. 
So the really different, the, the really only differentiating features between the two is read stem block cells. So these are these cells here. They look like two neutrons, uh, two nucleus. I don't actually know what they are, but they they basically the differentiation between Hodgkin, uh, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Most of the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas are actually B cell lymphomas than T cell lymphomas for some reason. Uh, and so both of them are associated with EBV, but they also uh, also associated with HIV. Uh, HCV, hepatitis C, um, also uh, helicobacter pylori, your mild lymphoma, and things like that. Um, usually to diagnose them, you have to take out the lymph nodes as well, and you treat them with chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Um, they also affect slightly different groups of lymph nodes. So your Hodgkin lymphomas usually only affect one specific group of lymph nodes, so like your cervical lymph nodes, whereas your non-Hodgkin usually affect your paraiotic, your iliac lymph nodes, your axillary lymph nodes, supraclavicular lymph nodes. It can affect everywhere, and they usually have more extra known involvement, such as your brain, CNS, things like that, or skin. Yeah, where non -Hod uh, whereas Hodgkin is more limited and easier to treat as well. Um, so you have multiple myeloma. This is the one that affects plasma cells. So you can imagine what it would affect if it affects plasma cells. So you, sh you can remember signs and symptoms from this um, acronym called CRAB. So you get hypercalcemia due to um, bone involvement. So they actually um, engage more osteoclasts as opposed to osteoblasts. So you get that, that imbalance. So you have more bone resorption. You get renal failure due to the cast deposition. So I, I don't really know if you guys know the immunoglobulin. So you know, IGs have like light chains. So light chains in multiple myeloma gets increased. So you get upregulation of plasma cells. So you get more regula upregulation of uh, monoclonal um, antibody production. So you have light chains. So light chains actually deposit in the renal tubules, clogging it up. So you get renal failure. Yeah. So you get anemia as well because of the replacement of bone marrow and any bony lesion. So you actually, if you go to search on Google, um, multiple myeloma um, osteolytic lesions, you actually see that it's a punched out lesion in the bone. It's quite cool. This is also why you get hypercalcemia because bone resorption in increases calcium levels as well. So investigations you do, probably, um, the, so these are relox bodies. So it's basically where the red blood cells clump together. You also get normal cystic, normal chromic anemia. Um, your analysis, you get these Ben um, Jones proteins, which is essentially the light chains. Yeah. So these are just the buzzwords. Probably just more helpful for studying. Yeah. Okay. Anyone? It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Or oh, you guys not know the answer? Anyone knows the answer? Anyone doesn't know the answer? Oh wait, so you guys know the answer. Why don't you tell me an answer? No, the girl. Sorry, I don't know your name. You're not sure? Okay. Wait, is anyone else not sure? Okay. So, so, who thinks that A is right? No one thinks A is right. Does everyone know why A is wrong? Yeah, okay. So, Male athlete who has undergone an altitude training, so you usually have upregulation of red blood cells to compensate with oxygen supply. So in these ones, you don't have an increase in hemoglobin. Oh, you do have an increase in hemoglobin, so it's not least likely. Um, COPD. So in COPD, is this the one that you guys don't quite know? Or you guys know about these ones. So in COPD, you basically get increased hit, uh, HB as well because it's a compensatory mechanism. To increase red blood cells. So if you actually see COPD patients, they're actually really red. Yeah, and um, they actually have a higher HP as well. Chronic alcohol link, these ones won't have it because they will have microcystic anemia, uh, megaloblastic macrocystic anemia. Um, EPO, that, that's the one that increases HP as well. Yeah.
Do you know the answer? Anyone knows the answer? Yep. Just pretty straightforward too. Does everyone know the answer? Yeah. If if you guys need any explanations, let me know. Yeah. So um, hemostasis and thrombosis. So um, hemostasis involves four main cells. So you get your endothelium and your subendothelium platelets and bromboglobins. So um, the initial stage, you get vasoconstriction. So whenever you get exposure of um, blood, uh, blood to the outside environment, your, your blood vessels will constrict, causing reduced blood flow because your body wants to reduce the amount of blood that's being leaked out to the environment. So in primary hemostasis, you get platelets. So these platelets are produced by megakerocytes. So um, usually you get uh, the platelets to, be, uh, to clump to the side of the environment and then the aggregate. To, produce, uh, to eventually produce a hemostatic plug. So secondary activation of platelets involves ADP and um, thromboxane A2. So these are the ones that are actually blocked by your drugs. So aspirin blocks um, your COX, which, produce, um, which produces thromboxane A2. So if you block this, your platelets don't aggregate, which is why um, platelets actually, uh, your aspirin actually blocks any arterial uh, clots from forming. You can also block um, your ADP receptors uh, through clopidogrel or ticagrelor. Uh, These are the ones that are often used in hospitals for stents as well. So often they're used in conjunction, not just one. So uh, we just want to disturb the names of the factors because I thought it was helpful. Yeah. So you get your secondary hemostasis. So this is where your clotting factors come into play. So you usually, the idea is to produce thrombin. That's what you want to, to eventually cause a fibrin clot. So by exposing the endothelium layer, you actually expose tissue factors. And tissue factors bind to factor 7, and then factor 7 um, activate factor 10 to, for, to cause um, prothrombin to, activate, to be activated into thrombin. And then this gets amplified to form more and more thrombin. Yeah. So um, once your thrombin is formed, you eventually get fibrinogen to form fibrin. So this forms your fibrin clot. So the idea of forming clot is that whilst you want the clot to form, you also want the clot to stop because you don't want your, your body to clot everywhere. So the idea is that you have a negative feedback to form more protein C and protein S and also antithrombin. There's an deficiency in the body that actually causes protein C and S deficiency where you actually get excessive clotting. Uh, clotting. You can also get deficiency of antithrombin to cause um, excessive clotting as well. So you have your extrinsic pathway, your intrinsic pathway. So ex extrinsic pathway, the really only differentiating factor is factor seven. Um, so it's actually just basically outside injury causing clotting. Intrinsic pathway is just exposure to some endothelial cartilage, um, causing um, usually caused by intravascular injury. So um, aspirin would, would work on your extrinsic pathway. No, your warfarin would work on your extrinsic pathway as well. So that's why you use INR to monitor that. So your coagulation study, you have your prothrombin and your APTT. AP, uh, prothrombin time is usually reported as INR everywhere um, to normalize the ratio as well. To, uh, so this, this is just measurement of your extrinsic pathway clotting time. And APTT is uh, measuring your intrinsic pathway. Um, so usually you have a mixing study to, to determine if it's an inhibitor present or a, um, or a factor deficiency. So if it corrects, it's a factor deficiency. Mixing studies is just mixing 50% of a normal plasma with the, the patient's plasma. Yeah, because plasma has causing factors. Yeah. So this summary table, really. Um, prolonged INR, you have warfarin deficiency or vitamin K deficiency because vitamin K produces factor 2, 7, 9, and 10, um, the, the channels. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you also get uh, factor seven deficiency, prolonged PT, and the rest of them. Yeah. Okay. Okay, bleeding disorders. So you, the main bleeding disorders are hemophilia. There's some other ones, but mainly hemophilia. Um, this is a von Willebrand's disease. So it's hemophilia A and B. Um, basically, you just know what factors they uh, don't have. 
So in factor deficiency, you won't have the, plate, uh, the platelet deficiency symptoms. So they're mostly deep tissue injuries because if you remember the clotting cascade, you have platelet aggregation first before you have clot uh, the clotting cascade. So if your platelets are fine, you won't have spontaneous bleeds, but you will have deep bleeds. So you have hemophilosis, so joint, joint bleeding. Um, these people actually often have um, arthritis after a certain period of time as well because they bleed into the joints, damaging the joint tissue as well. Um, they also have muscle bruising, um, contusion as well. Yeah. So when Willebrand's disease, on the other hand, is uh, uh, it's kind of like a platelet disorder. More, it's more like a platelet disorder because it causes um, uh, deficiency platelet aggregation and clotting as well. Because one von Willebrand has that signaling thing to platelet. Yeah. So there's different types of von Willebrand's disease. There's uh, type one, type two, and type three. Type 1 is more of a quantitative defect. It's not really serious. Most of them don't know that they have von Willebrand's disease. This is the most common um, type of um, deficient, uh, of uh, bleeding disorder, by the way. Um, factors 2 and 3, on the other hand, is more like a qualitative defect. And uh, type 3 is a complete absence. So these ones usually present with mucosal bleeding, so your platelet-type bleeding. So you have epistaxis, which is ble uh, bleeding of your nose, bleeding gums, menorrhagia, things like that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so procoagulant disorders. Um, these are probably the ones that are even less important than bleeding, but it's probably more important than your uh, clinical years as well. Um, so you have a cost trial. Um, so you have endothelial injury, also blood flow, hypercoagulable state. This is probably more important than OSCEs as well, because you want to find out what they actually have. Yeah. So DVT. DVT is basically clotting in your lower leg or limb, but it can be up to the eyelid. It's usually um, unilateral, but if, by, if it's bilateral, you look for other causes as well. Um, usually you have edema, um, pain in calves, warm erythema. Some of them might present compartment syndrome. It's really uncommon. Um, yeah. P, on the other hand, is where a thrombus from the DVT embolizes um, into your, into your um, uh, pulmonary uh, veins. So these ones actually lodge here. So you can see this is actually the clot. And usually it doesn't form to the vessel wall, showing that it's an embolus, because it's it's clearly like a leg vein that caused that. Yep. So usually you have pleuritic chest pain. So you have like an in and out, you have pain while you're breathing in and out. Uh, dyspnea, hemoptysis as well. Um, sometimes if you do a uh, ECG, they always tell you that you have an S1QT3 T3. I don't know if you guys have ever heard. So basically an S1, um, it would just be a bigger dip, higher dip, higher dip, based on S, T, and Q, yeah. So, but most of the time, people presenting a PE only have sinus tachycardia. That's really the only sign you get from them, sinus tachycardia. Yeah. Um, usually the gold standard test to do would be CTPA, like CT pulmonary angiogram. And um, the people who are contraindicated with CTPA are people who can't handle contrast. Um, and also people, basically people with renal failure and also people who are pregnant. Uh, we do a VQ scan if the person is pregnant, um, but do not do a VQ scan in people with COPD because they will retain the thing. Yeah. Uh, D-dimer test is um, debatable because if you have high clinical suspicion of a clot, you're not going to do a D-dimer because it's not going to tell you anything. And it's really sensitive. Like a normal person would have, may have an elevated D-dimer, but it's really not going to tell you anything. You guys know what D-dimer is? Yep. Yeah, okay. No, transfusion. Bless you. So transfusion, um, you have your ABO blood groups and your rhesus blood groups. So ABO, pretty pretty easy to identify. And um, the antibodies present are basically the opposite of what they have. So um, rhesus antibodies, most people are rhesus positive. Um, the rhesus negative one, these, was the, these are the people who have more troubles, especially with pregnancy, so hemolytic disease of the newborn. So these ones can cross, uh, cross the placenta and the person with negative um, rhesus, mm -hmm. it gets exposed to positive rhesus. Uh, it's very dangerous for future pregnancy. So this is the story about James Harrison. I don't know if you guys heard about it. The, ones on, the one of the news a couple of months ago who was talking about letting blood, like giving a lot of blood. You guys read? You guys don't read the news? Okay. Yeah, this is the guy who, who gave a lot of blood and then um, helped a lot of mothers. So the idea is that when a rhesus mother who is negative has a rhesus positive um, child, and then the mother gets rhesus positive blood. So this James Harrison guy actually has rhesus positive blood due to multiple blood transfusions. So he's 
he is rhesus negative, but he has rhesus positive um, antibodies. So when you give a mother who has been exposed with uh, rhesus positive blood, you give them a lot of these like vaccines, it actually wipes out all the, all the um, antigens of the baby. So the mother doesn't actually get into contact with the positive bodies forming like immune response. So if they have a second pregnancy, it's not going to harm them. Yeah. Because because rhesus antibodies can cross the placenta, causing like spontaneous like abortion or anything like that. Yeah. Sorry? D? D? Yeah. Okay. Uh, pharmacology. That's probably a bit more important because clinical years, you actually do use a lot of pharmacology. I know I hate pharmacology too, but yeah, no one likes pharmacology, but it's probably important to know. So aspirin works on the COX pathway, um, as I mentioned before. So it actually inhibits uh, thromboxin A2. So um, it actually prevents uh, platelet from aggregating. So um, Good thing to remember is that antiplatelets really work on arterial um, thrombosis, whereas um, anticoagulants work on um, uh, more of the veins. Yeah. So things like aspirin and clopidogrel works on um, things like atherosclerosis and stents as well. Um, so aspirin is non reversible, um, and long term use of um, aspirin can actually cause um, peptic ulcer because it's an insert. Yeah. Clopidogrel and ticagrelol um, actually inhibits T uh, ADP. Um, I think it's called PGY12 something, yeah. Uh, streptokinase is it's, um, it's actually from bacteria. That's why they don't like using it anymore because you can actually have an allergic reaction. So streptokinase, you can only use once. You can't use it another time. Um, but they don't use it anymore because it's, it's people get allergic response and it's quite bad because it's produced by bacteria. It's not endogenous, yeah. Um, Alteplase, on the other hand, is a tissue plus minogen activator. These ones they always tell you in preclinical is actually used for AMIP, but no one really uses them because you can actually get hemorrhage with um, Alteplase. But sometimes um, Alteplase, when, once once a doctor told me the only time she really used Alteplase was when um, this patient actually couldn't use any uh, anticoagulants like heparin, plexane, um, because of the bleeding risk because um, the person had a neuro operation. And this person got really hemodynamically uh, unstable after a clot happened and she had to use Alteplase, but the person died in the end because blood out. Yeah. So Alteplase you really only use if the person's hemodynamically unstable. And oh, you can only use it if it's within a time limit. I don't remember what time limit is, like four hours or something. Yeah. Um, so warfarin inhibits 2, 7, 9, 10. It's a vitamin K antagonist. Um, you require constant INR monitoring. So I guess it's falling out of favor um, with a lot of people because of that. Um, you have to use warfarin with um, metallic valves or mechanical heart valves. Um, things like your NOAX or DOAX are not uh, approved with your mechanical heart valves. So it's, a, I guess, a, a weighing up between tissue heart valves versus, mecha um, versus mechanical heart valves. Um, warfarin you cannot use um, in pregnancy. I believe especially at first trimester because it's teratogenic. Um, you have to use cutsin and heparin bridging. So um, warfarin it inhibits factor 2, 7, 9, and 10, but it also inhibits um, protein C and S. So in the first week or so, it actually inhibits C and S more than the other factors. So you actually become prothrombotic in the first few weeks. So you have to bridge them with heparin or clexine to ensure that they do not clot. So you have to leave them in the hospital, monitor the iron and make sure they don't clot. Um, vitamin K can be given as an antidote because it's a vitamin K antagonist. Um, you have to watch out with antibiotics with um, warfarin because it interacts with a lot of antibiotics. Um, unfractionated heparin. So unfractionated heparin is, um, it's really strong, um, but it's not used as often as uh, clexine or anoxaparin. Because um, heparin has to be monitored as well use a, uh, using APTT. You also have to constantly infuse them. And the half-life he of heparin is just minutes. I think it's really short. Um, but it's, uh, it also causes this um, phenomenon known as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, where the person can clot or bleed. Um, usually, it's quite severe and mortality rate is really high, but only affects a very small amount of patients. And usually, ICU patients who are on large amounts of heparin or post-op patients. 
Um, usually, the heparin is also used on a lot of like induction device, like um, catheters or whatever, to prevent them from clotting. Yeah, um, you can reverse heparin though with uh, with protein sulfate. Um, whereas you can't reverse clexin. Um, the the protein sulfate doesn't inhibit it as much. Um, and also, heparin is a subcut administration as opposed to an infusion. It's usually used as VT pro uh, prophylaxis in hospitals. So you have your DOAX. So DOAX, you have the bigger trend, um, apexaban and rivoxaban. So whatever with an X in it is a vexatin inhibitor. Whatever is not is a uh, thrombin inhibitor. Yep. So these ones, you don't actually need to monitor them. Um, it's hard to reverse them, but uh, the bigger trend does have a reversal agent now. But um, I think it's pretty expensive. Um, it's increasingly preferred to warfarin because you don't um, uh, you don't have to monitor them, but you can't use them in clinical heart valves because it's not um, trials have not shown efficacy. I think that's all I have. Yeah. Any questions? No. No. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay.